So today I'm going to talk to you about ant control and uh, different uh, methods and strategies that we can use to control ants uh, with focus on speed of control. So uh, I'm going to give you, uh, provide some in introductory information on ants. Uh, so for those of you who are very experienced, you know, please bear with me. Um, but I'll assure you, you know, it will get more complex in advance. So uh, you just need to wait a little bit. So I do that because, you know, I want to make sure everyone is on the same page, especially newcomers, people who just joined, started uh, pest control. All right, introduction to ants. So I'm sure all of you are familiar to some extent, or maybe some of you are very familiar with ants. And so generally speaking, like many other insects, they have head, thorax, and abdomen. Uh, we use a uh, different term terminology for, uh, for you know, referring to different parts of their body, like mesosoma, and then they have this uh, pedial or kind of like a waist, right? And it could be a one segmented, two segmented, and then the abdomen is called metasoma, you know, and if you, especially if you look at ant ident identification keys. Okay, so they have elbow and antennae, almost all ants have that. And then they have metapleural glands, which are unique to ants, and they're responsible for producing antifungus, antifungi, and antibiotic fluids, because if you can imagine inside a nest, usually inside the soil, the humidity is high and any type of fungus and bacteria can grow there and you know, kill ants. So, so this, these glands help to produce that uh, antibacterial, antifungi material to kind of protect the nest against um, these microorganisms. And I mentioned the waste. So for those of you who recently joined pest control, um, usually, you know, like, like usually the general public, you know, makes this mistake, but it doesn't hurt to review. So uh, most of the termites, when you see them in the field, they have a, like, a, like, a, like a light tan, uh, light colored uh, body versus ants, which can be, you know, anything from red to yellow, orange, red to brown or black. So one way to distinguish them is the, the waste that ants have. Um, and of course, termites don't have it. And then the second one is the elbowed antennae, which you can see in uh, ants, but you don't see that in termites. And uh, and yes, so so for the alate or winged individuals, swarmers, you know, another way to distinguish that is that ants have um, uh, the 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 front and back wings have have different sizes, but in termites they're more similar in size. Okay. Uh, because of the uh, waste that ants have, you know, uh, they are restricted on what they can eat, what they can feed on. So there's some major implications of having such a narrow waist uh, for ants. And it means that they cannot really uh, digest large particles, solid particles. So they need to really chew on stuff and they can only pass tiny, tiny, tiny particles into their stomach. So when they feed on larger stuff, they're usually uh, dependent on late stage larvae in the nest to break down and digest the material. So anytime they gather uh, solid food, they bring it back to the nest, they feed it to the uh, larvae, especially the later stage larvae, which, which have larger mandibles and they chew on stuff and they feed on it and then they regurgitate the fluid made out of, you know, like enzymes and, and the food particles. And then that's when most of the worker ants can feed on this stuff. So they cannot feed on larger stuff. So this, this is very important in ants in ants biology and also in ant control um, because again, you know, um, adult worker ants cannot feed on solid food for the most part. 
they can take it back to the nest. You see them do that, but, but it doesn't mean that they can actually um, feed on and digest that material. Okay, so problems that ants cause, you know, it can be anything from nuisance to um, causing problems in the landscape, you know, go after uh, aphids, tending aphids, uh, psyllids, like in the case of the, for example, Asian citrus psyllid, it's a big deal. The more ants you have, the more protection those pests in the landscape get against uh, parasitoids, against uh, lady beetles and other natural enemies. So um, by disrupting that uh, relationship or mutualism, uh, we can do a better job in controlling the landscape pests too. Okay, and then some ants stink like fire ants. Uh, and of course, when they get inside homes, that's when they enter the structural pest control uh, uh, kind of like um, realm and they invade food sources. They get into pantry, into kitchen or other places. And also some of them can damage structural wood like uh, carpenter ants, right? Uh, so here are some of the examples I'm sure you're familiar, especially uh, people from, from Southern California to uh, South, you know, from here, California to Florida. Uh, uh, in many places, you know, you have fire ants. I mean, red important fire ants. Um, the native fire ant that we deal with everywhere pretty much is the uh, uh, Southern fire ants, which look very similar, but... Um, but if you look look under microscope, you know the front of the head, the uh, clypeus, you know, has um, like two kind of like projections versus red and point fire ants that have uh, three projections in the front of the head. Anyhow, uh, but many ants can sting. You know, harvester ants can sting, and that's actually very painful. Uh, big headed ants, and of course, you know, the red and point fire ants and southern fire ants and many other fire ants, they can sting. And uh, it can be really problem problematic for uh, school children um, because, you know, they're, they're usually on the ground, either sitting or they fall down a lot. And if they hit a mound or so, then it could be a big problem. So different ant species build nests in different places, right? Sometimes, most, actually most of the time, they're in the soil, right? Like the fire ants, uh, the Argentine ants, many other ones uh but but sometimes you know they uh get into structure they can build nests inside walls like the other's house ant um ghost ants if you're familiar um when i was living in florida you know we, we used to have ghost ants all the time inside the house and it was, it was so difficult to control them um so that's what they do sometimes you know they can get inside the structure and have their main part of the nest above the ground. So these pests, these ants with this ability are a good candidate to become structural pests. Because if you have to be in the soil, if you have to have your nest in the soil, then you can't really reside inside the structure above the ground. But if you can do that, then you know that opens a lot of doors to you, I mean, to an ant species I'm talking about. Uh, and then uh, sometimes, you know, they get into wood, like carpenter ants. Uh, we have uh, velvet tree ants. Uh, they can get similar to termites. They can get into studs, rafters, um, door frames, and you name it. Um, and the, the ones that are uh, more dependent on moisture, you, you, you see them in, uh, in forests, you know, feeding on uh, fallen trees and logs and stuff like that. So they can be small or big. Um, so the smallest one that I've um, dealt with is the ghost ant and rover ants. Those are the smallest one. And I believe the largest ones that I deal with uh, are the carpenter ants. They're you know, in, in my region, at least, you know, in, in urban areas, though, those are the larger ones. So I mentioned the waste and having one node or two nodes. Uh, this is a very good way of classifying ants. And um, so sometimes, you know, like the top picture, if you look, you only see one node, but sometimes the node is 
hidden under the abdomen because the abdomen is folding forward and then the uh let's say this is the um node it, it covers the uh the node so sometimes you have to you know like like kill a kill an ant or like just collect it and then um you know just just using some for some sort of like a forceps or like a pin to remove the abdomen or move it back to be able to see the node so just be aware of that uh, and some ants have two nodes the interesting thing is that all the stinging ants the sting, uh, that have stingers have two nodes on their, uh, on their waist. So if you see an ant with one node, it means that they cannot sting. Yeah. And usually they have other mechanisms for defense. It's a, it's a chemical defense. Um, for stinger ants, it's also a chemical defense. But, but for other ones, you know, with one node, they usually spray uh, stuff on their enemy or when they get disturbed but they don't sting uh, other ants or animals. So Argentine ant is an example of uh, an ant with one note that doesn't sting. And of course, fire ants and uh, big headed ants and pharaoh ants and little fire ant and many other ones, they can sting. So in uh, pest control, uh, we what, what really matters is the role of different ants in the colony or cast, you know, cast means a group of individuals within a colony which do a certain task. So you have a queen or queens, depending on the colony, because some colonies have multiple queens, and they're in charge of reproduction and starting a colony. And then you have males, which are temporary. You know, they you see them at a certain point, uh, uh, time of the year, and then they they come out, they swarm, and they they mate. But either they die shortly after or they get executed by uh, workers. Uh, so they're temporary. Uh, and this is similar to like honeybees and other ones. So males are in the colony just for a short period of period of time. And then you have the workers, of course. And sometimes you have major workers, you know, which sometimes called soldiers. Um, but some ant species don't have that. Like the Argentine ants, there's no soldier caste. There's no major worker. Uh, they're all about the same size. Um, they can have a, a different color, as I mentioned. So it could be like they could be bicolored, you know, the front and the head and the thorax could be lighter and then the abdomen darker and anything from yellow to, to brown, you know, kind of like a reddish brown and dark brown and black. So uh, colony size could be very small to a few, you know, from a few hundred individuals to millions of individuals, depending on the species and depending on the age of the colony. And in the later slides, I'll talk about the importance of uh, colony size in, uh, in management. So yes, yeah, so the colony size can uh, affect how ants forage or defend the nest and other things. So for example, um, smaller colonies, they forage shorter distances. So this has been shown by research. So like, for example, fire ants, if you have an incipient colony, a small colony, they're not going to forage like 30, 40 feet. They're going to just forage, you know, five feet, you know. But if you have a mature colony, a large colony, they can easily uh, forage up to 50, 60, or even more feet um, from the main part of the nest. So they have pheromones, obviously, right? That's how ants find food. So they go kind of like randomly around. And then as soon as they find uh, a good source of food, they uh, start laying down a trail and invite other members and recruit other members of the colony to come and feed on the uh, actual uh, food source. So some other ant species can eavesdrop on the trails produced by other species. So they can know that, you know what, these Argentine ants are uh, into, uh, up to something, they found food, so let's follow the trail and you know um, feed on the same uh, source of food and, and sometimes they're successful. Uh, so uh, they also produce alarmed pheromones, 
you know, when they're in danger, that invites other ones to come and join to defend the colony and uh, uh, push out an intruder uh, that is trying to come into a nest. So as I mentioned, they form this uh, mutualistic uh, relationship with hemipterans. So anything from scales, uh, scale insects, soft scale insects, aphids, mealybugs, and psyllids, um, they, they also make a relationship, like have a similar relationship with white flies. But the thing with white flies is that they don't just drop the uh, uh, honeydew from where they are feeding on the plant, but they kind of like throw it out, you know, like, like catapult it, you know, to, um, to, 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 a, to, to a distance, you know. So, so that's why you don't see when you have white flies, let's say on a top leaf, you don't see uh, the accumulations, honeydew and sooty mold right beneath of that leaf. Usually, usually see it in you know, on the sides. And that's because they don't, don't just drop it. They just, you know, um, throw it out. You know, they catapult it, you know, uh, with high speed. So that's the twist uh, for white flies. And so I already mentioned, you know, that, that they protect uh, pests against natural enemies. Uh, so most ants are omnivores, meaning that they feed on a lot of stuff, you know, they can prey on some worms and larvae, but they're also scavengers and they feed on plants too, on seeds and other parts of the plants um, that you can see here. Um, so some examples, leaf cutter ants, you know, they feed on a fungus that they grow inside their nests on leaves. And generally speaking, we divide ants into sweet feeders and grease or uh, protein feeders. Um, so fire ants, for example, are grease oil or protein feeders and, and Argentine ants are sweet feeders. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't feed on the other category, like, like fire ants um, take sugary water and sweet stuff fine. But when, when you give them the option, they always or most of the time go after the greasy stuff. And the same applies to Argentine ants. Uh, so behavior, the feeding behavior may change in some ants. So in some, like in the spring, some ant species go mostly after protein rich uh, food because they're reproducing and they have a lot of larvae to feed and, and that requires a lot of protein. But when you go into the summertime, then they switch to sweet stuff. So so in some species, the, uh, the change is very drastic. Like, like it's kind of like they reject the other type of food. Like in the springtime, some, some ants really don't show much interest to uh, sweet stuff. Um, and in the summertime, you know, the opposite. But, but in some other species, it's not necessarily that drastic, but still happens. Like, like even Argentine ants, you know, they have this seasonal thing. So in the, in the spring, they go more after after more protein stuff and then sweet stuff in the summertime. So queens, you know, uh, develop similar to workers, but then they feed more. And that's how it works for honeybees too. And um, so if workers are sterile females, uh, so they can reproduce for the most part. Some species they can, you know, it's a com complex kind of biology there. But, uh, but for the most part, they can't lay eggs, they can't reproduce, uh, but they can work and defend the colony or sting and stuff like that. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some advanced stuff. Okay, let's get into management. So for ants, obviously, there are many ways to control them. Usually we go with chemical control, um, anything you know, from liquid insecticide, dust, or bait, but we also have non-chemical methods, which I'm not gonna cover much today, except one, uh, mechanical removal, removal of the nest, cultural control, you know, when you have a lands landscaping around, um, in, in agricultural fields, the mulching can really slow down movement of ants, and exclusion and sanitation, uh, which are important, um, but again, you know, I'm not gonna cover and, and, and sometimes they're, they're really difficult to do. So fast or slow, that's the main focus of my talk. So 
when it comes to ant, ant control uh, or any other pests, really, um, we can choose different methods, right? We can use diff different chemicals. We can use um, some non-chemical methods. Um, but usually, you know, we can divide them into fast and slow control. Okay, so for example, if you have, if you can remove a nest of an ant species, then you're quickly removing a lot of the uh, individuals, a lot of the, a lot of the workers and other cats, you know, from the from a property or from a location, and you can quickly kind of like do a good job in in getting rid of the pest, right? Or when you use chemical control, if you use neurotoxins, you know, like pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, you know, those are fast acting uh, insecticides that affect nervous system. And that's, that's why they're fast, you know, they quickly disrupt the function of the nervous system. But sometimes, so these are really appreciated by customers, right? Because, you know, we're taking care of the problem quickly and it, it's much easier to explain what you did, why you did it, because it works very fast. So everyone is happy. But sometimes there could be some potential disadvantages. When you do like a, choose a, like a slower acting chemical, for example, like an IGR or you use a low dose boric acid or something like that, uh, then you're not going to get that fast action, right? And usually it's less appreciated by clients in short term, right? Unless you explain to them why you're doing this or sometimes when, when sometimes clients want you to use a specific method or chemical because they're concerned about A, B, C, D, right? Uh, but there could be some potential advantages to that. So let's talk about uh, faster methods. So nest removal. Sometimes you know ants come from from the roof. You know you have uh, tree branches touching the roof, and then you have a lot of uh, leaf litter uh, accumulated. You know on the roof, and that's when you know, like for example, in the case of Argentine ants, toward the end of summer, all of a sudden you know thousands and thousands of ants can find their way inside the house and can raid invade the house and it can cause a big problem. So in this case, cases like this, you know, removing all this leaf litter can, can do uh, really great, can, can really take care of the problem very quickly, right? Because if you don't, you're going to have many, many ants on the roof somewhere and, and it will take time, you know, if you want to use, a chem use chemical control. So it really makes sense sometimes to do mechanical, mechanically removing, physically removing a nest or part of the nest if possible. But it's unfortunately rarely possible because you don't always have a situation like this. And if they're in the soil, you know, you have to dig really deep to get rid of the nest. So when you use faster methods, you know, for example, use bifenthrin, you know, uh, or chemicals like that, you can kill foragers very quickly. And I uh, emphasize here foragers, not the rest, rest of the colony, okay? It could be anything from a few hours to uh, one, two days, you know, and then they're gone. So that's, that's really good, keeps customer happy. And I have nothing against it. It's very good. Uh, customers, you know, really appreciate it initially, and I'll talk about what 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 may happen later. You know, if they come back, uh, so that's that's uh, that would be a problem. But initially, everyone is happy, and you can really the good thing about uh, using these fast acting pesticide is that you can quickly reduce pest pressure. So pest pressure means that like the number of um, pests that you have around, if you have a huge huge uh, uh, Argentine ant colony or fire ant colonies uh, around the house. And, and it's really difficult to do a good job controlling them if you don't knock it down, you know, knock down the population. Because when you have too many, you know, sooner or later they find, they'll find another way of getting into a structure or if it's on the lawn, you know, to, they'll find a way, they'll sting people you know, uh, shortly, you know, there would be, there'll be another incidence uh, very soon. So, so this is really great about using fast acting methods. 
And it also, you know, using fast or slow methods, you know, is also dependent on the contract types, you know, that you have. If you're just doing incidental treatment, you know, somebody called and you're going there and there's no like a recurring service or like a annual contract, then you're limited on what you can do. And it only makes sense to use a fast acting method, you know, to get rid of the, to uh, get rid of the problem and keep the customer happy and then go to the next side, right? But if you have a recurring service, you have a contract, long-term contract, then you can think of um, using other methods, you know, or combine a fast acting method with a slow acting method for larger impact on the population. Fire ants are uh, a good example on this. So if you use fast acting methods, uh, there are some products, you know, like if you spray, for example, I mean, you're not going to get good results in the long term, right? And then the fire, fire ants will come back very quickly. And this is not ideal, you know, in the long term. But if you use slower acting uh, active ingredients, uh, which I'm going to talk uh, in, in, in later slides, then um, you need to, the customer needs to wait a little bit, but then the results are much better. You know, the long-term results are much uh, more uh, successful. Uh, better control, yes. All right, so before talking about the speed, uh, other aspects of the speed of control, I'm just gonna provide some um, very interesting facts about the biology of ants and um, and then go and go back to this, the, the topic of the speed. Uh, so in any given colony, ant colony, only a small percentage of the workers uh, or the whole colony actually forage. So usually it's under 20%, okay? This is very interesting and important. So for example, a study on harvester ants uh, uh, showed that only seven to 15% of the colony actually forages. The rest of the, uh, the colony, they don't forage. They're usually back in the nest doing other tasks. Another study you know, um, found something even more interesting. So they found that not only uh, a small percentage, around 10% of the colony forage, but also they found that 40% of the colony was inactive, doing nothing, okay, idle. So not so hardworking, right? So 40% of the colony, they found that, you see these uh, colorations, the, this marking that they put on individual ants, and I really wonder how they did that because it's so difficult to do. But anyhow, they watch ants inside the colony very carefully and then they mark them and they realize that the 40% of the colony is doing nothing. So uh, they don't forage, they don't uh, take care of the brood, they don't clean, they don't feed on anything, they don't exchange food with others, absolutely nothing. So um, after studying that, you know, they realized that these inactive ants are served as a reserve labor force. Okay, so they intentionally remove some of the active foragers, remove more and more and more to see what happens. And then what they saw was that these inactive idle workers all of a sudden become recruited. They'll, they'll, they start foraging. So they're there ready to be called. And as soon as there's a need, they start working. Okay, so the larger the colony get, probably they can have a larger reserve uh, labor, uh, labor force. Uh, and this is very interesting, but just pay attention to the percentages. Only a small percentage of a colony actually forages. So there's another uh, fact, necrophoresis, uh, um, which means carrying dead bodies. So ants, termites, uh, bees and wasps, all of them do that. So when they see a, a dead individual inside the colony, a dead colony mate, they quickly quickly remove it from the colony to uh, prevent spreading diseases and stuff like that, okay? So you can see here, this ant is moving stuff. And then there's an Argentine ant in the lower picture moving a dead colony mate out of the colony. So this is an important behavior in ant control. And they also make these graveyards. So if you look at the uh, nests of Argentine ants and fire ants, when, um, especially when you do a treatment, 
sometimes you know one two days or sometimes one week later you you come back and you see a pile of dead ants right next to the entrance of the nest and you see more ants bringing these dead bodies and just pile them you know in graveyard so that's what they do you know they just want to quickly get rid of these dead bodies because it's a sanitation practice then you have another interesting fact in ants is that anytime um, you do a treatment uh, you have this phenomena called phenomenon called horizontal transfer and it comes from public health uh, so, so in public health disease transmission, you have vertical transmission when, for example, a mother passes a disease to her child, you know, like Zika, you know, and then you have this horizontal transfer like me passing flu or somebody passes flu to me because, you know, we just shook hands or we, we saw each other somewhere. So in ants, in, in, in uh, pest control, we have this horizontal transfer phenomenon which occurs when uh, an ant gets exposed to a pesticide either by feeding on a bait or by just passing over a treated surface and then they come back to the nest and then they uh, exchange uh, uh, food like this uh, animated gif that is showing trophallaxis or me exchanging food and or they just touch each other like with their antennae groom each other and that's how they pass the active ingredients uh, to other members of the colony, okay? So you can see the, um, the types here. It could be like a mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, trophallaxis or it could be a contact uh, that, that causes this transfer. And this is very important because the more transfer you have, the larger impact you can make on the colony, the, the larger the insecticide treatment will be. Um, let me check the time. Okay, so... Uh, Slower chemical control means that there's a higher chance of horizontal transfer. If you, ant, if you kill your ants very quickly, they don't have, uh, you, you're not giving them the chance to maximize their contact with colony members or exchanging food, maximizing their uh, food exchange with other members of the colony, okay? But when you use a slow acting product, then you're giving them the chance to do that. And different active ingredients have different uh, inherent uh, properties on uh, or potential to get transferred. For example, one study showed that fipronil has, has a very, very high transfer rates compared to bifenthrin and beta-cyflurthrin, okay? So it means that, you know, anytime you apply by a, a fipronil, uh, it's more, much more likely that ants will pass it to or like simply, you know, ants will pass it to more individuals compared to other ones. So other ones have it, but some active ingredients have a higher capacity to get transferred or move between individuals. And another aspect, interesting aspect about this study is that they found that uh, it doesn't matter if you provide live or dead ants inside a nest to check the horizontal transfer, both of them cause similar amount of mortality suggesting that when you put dead ants inside the colony or when ants feed on something or get exposed and go back and die inside a nest, uh, the, the behavior that I just mentioned, necrophoresis, is, is uh, responsible for, for uh, the transfer of the pesticides. So when they see a dead ant, they quickly want to take it out and remove it from the nest. And during that process, because you know, they have to carry it with their mouth parts, with their antennae, they get also exposed to the pesticide. So that's, that's the beauty of it because the ants that go back, they don't have to stay live. You know, it's okay if they died inside the nest and they're still going to pass the uh, insecticide to other colony mates. Another interesting factor is the colony size. So the larger the colony gets, the larger amount of pesticide is needed to destroy that colony or to make it collapse, okay? So when ants feed on a bait or get exposed in, to an insecticide, we call these ants donor ants. So they're gonna get, the, uh, get exposed to the pesticide and they're gonna bring the material on their body or in their mouth, you know, if they fed on a bait and pass it to other ones. So, uh, so when you have a large colony, you need to have more of these ants, you know, take the material, go back and pass it to others. So if you look at this graph, 
It's not the simplest graph, but um, I'll try to make it uh, as simple as I can. So if you look at the red box on left, this is uh, the experiment in which they release 10 donor ants uh, inside a 100, among 100 individuals of ants. Okay, so a very small colony. As, as you can see, around, I think, 90% of the uh, recipients, uh, other you know, uh, colony mates which did not directly uh, get exposed to the pesticide, tested positive for the active ingredient, meaning that uh, the donor ones, the 10 donor ants, they passed the, uh, this is a bait study. They, they did food exchange with others and then they passed the, the uh, chemical. So most of them tested positive. But when you, if you look at the right red box on the very right of the graph, you can see that um, the same 10 donor ants when they were placed among 1000 ants, you can see that you know, the, the dilution effect here caused around 45%, less than 50% of the ants uh, recipients, uh, recipient ants tested, testing positive for the chemical, meaning that the chemical got diluted and it could not be traced in a lot of the ants in the larger colony, okay? So um, as more and more colony exchange, for, yes. So, so the pesticide gets diluted basically. So now let's connect the dots, okay? Most of the worker ants don't forage, but can be recruited when uh, foragers die, current foragers die. So less than 20%, usually much less than that, maybe 10%, 15%. Uh, but the key here is that dead workers can be replaced by inactive workers, okay? So given time, a slow acting insecticide can kill a higher percentage of a colony compared to a fast acting insecticide due to higher horizontal transfer rates, okay? And also necrophoresis, you know, plays an important role uh, because they, when they move out the dead bodies, that's when they get exposed uh, to the pesticide. And then, um, the last one that I just mentioned, ingested insecticide get diluted in the nest as more food exchange happens. So in theory, you need more and more donor ants to pass the material to other members of the colony. So control speed and colony elimination. So sometimes, you know, actually many times we don't necessarily want to um, uh, eliminate or eradicate a colony. I mean. This is ideal, but I'm telling you in, in the field, that rarely happens. Even when we don't see any foragers after application, and we assume that we have killed the whole colony, but in reality, we have just killed the foragers or maybe a portion of the, uh, a good portion of the ants or so workers and soldiers and whatever inside the colony, but the queen is still alive underground. And, you know, we don't have a way to tell, you know, to, to detect that. But uh, so anyhow, so many times, you know, may, maybe killing foragers is enough. You know, you just want to quickly get rid of the problem. And I have nothing against that. that that's, that's actually good. Uh, but, but if you want to have, make a larger impact, then it's better to go with, uh, uh, slower acting products, and I'm going to cover, uh, I'll talk about those products. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, products ha which have uh, neurotoxic properties, they act fast. You know, anything, uh, all the pyrethroids, all the uh, neonicotinoids, these are all, uh, and, and indoxicarb, you know, these are all uh, neurotoxins and affect nervous system, and that's why they act faster. But then, um, if you have, if you look at um, uh, the products that disrupt metabolism of insects, those act those work slower because you know it takes time for these material to um, kind of like uh, disrupt the uh, energy production, and then uh, usually insects you know have a reserve of energy molecules, and then, so it takes a little bit more time. And then the slowest ones are insect growth regulators, okay? And you can see some examples here, neurotoxins. Uh, I'm talking about baits here for fire ants, you know, like Advion, for example, has indoxicarb. It takes two to seven days to kill, and then energy disruptors, two to six weeks, and IGRs are the slowest here, taking six to eight weeks. So you need to really make sure 
uh, that uh, using IGR is practical. It works great in the long run, but in short term, you know, it's not a good option necessarily. Um, so ideal insecticides for short-term control are fast acting, could be repellent or non-repellent, okay? For long-term, you need to go with slow to moderate speed, you know, products that have that speed to get higher transfer rates and stuff like that. Insect growth regulators are designed to slowly destroy entire colony by disrupting reproduction, either reducing egg production or disrupting uh, molting, right? And um, yeah, so they usually start uh, kicking in when the next generation of adults are uh, get, you know, uh, screwed up basically, you know, because they can't develop into normal adults. And um, another thing to mention is repellency or deterrency or deterrence. So repellency refers to the fact that, you know, some insecticides like most pyrethroids, you know, they kind of like repel insects. They know what something is going on. Uh, but repellency doesn't happen immediately, meaning that when you treat uh, a concrete surface, for example, and then you have ants coming in, they're going to pass, they're going to cross that uh, spray. They're going to cross that treatment a few times sometimes. And in the process, some of them die or many of them die. But then after some time, they realize that, you know, there's something wrong here. Let's avoid that. So, uh, and it's very good if you want to keep uh, a pest away from the structure. Uh, you need to write, use the right uh, product. Um, so I mentioned, yeah, most pyrethroids, and then you have non-repellent insecticides that uh, are designed to kill, to maximize kill because insects have no idea what's going on. They cross over the material and then die. However, just a word of caution, if you use too much or use a, like a high concentration of these insecticides, they can show repellency too. Okay, so here's a study showing that when you use higher concentration of fipronil, you can get repellents, uh, repellency uh, in termites, okay? So, and it applies to all other groups. So to repel or not to repel, uh, sometimes, you know, I hear people saying that, oh, it's better not to repel, um, you know, let's use non-repellent stuff. So sometimes that's, 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 that might be true, but other times repellency is actually good, is uh, beneficial, you know, keeps bugs out of an area, especially when you don't care what's happening outside the area of treatment. You know, you can have millions of cockroaches, you know, away in the sewer system. And as long as they don't come in, that's okay. The same with ants. But other times, if you want to kill uh, maximize kill, maybe using a non-repellent insecticide is better because they don't know what's going on and they cross over the treated surface and they die and die. And so hopefully you'll kill a much larger of portion of the colony. But it's up to you. I'm not here to judge. Uh, so just quickly, because I don't have much time, uh, eradication versus knockdown versus management and repelling. Okay, so eradication, uh, these, this is a confusing term, but I like to use it when we're trying to kill uh, or remove all the colonies of a species from a larger area, you know, from a city, from, from a, a larger area. That's when I would recommend using eradication. And knockdown means simply when you wanna you really hit the population, the infestation hard, uh, so that you know you can do other stuff and and you know it's a, to get a relief from the pest pressure. Then you have management, which again is a confusing term. Different people use it in in made in very different ways. But I like to use say call you know, like use the word management when we're trying to reduce population, not necessarily something extreme or like eradication, but just trying to control and and keep it. Um, uh, keep the infestations, uh, the, the pressure uh, low, you know, small. And then repelling. So repelling, what happens is that you apply like this red circle around the, the treated area. Some ants keep passing or crossing your treatment uh, band and some of them die and some of them just avoid. And after some time, what happens is that, you know, the, the, the whole 
um, infestation, you know, stops coming into the treated area, right? So it also reduces pressure, not necessarily by maximizing killing, but by keeping them out. Okay, nest versus aggregation site. Um, sometimes people call like cockroach nest, and I don't like that, so I just wanted to mention here. Uh, so nest, I would call nest something that is built by insects, not just like a harborage. Um, so dose dependency, again, you know, some products let you uh, tweak the uh, concentration, the dosage, and uh, to some extent, you know, so just, just be aware that, you know, lower doses, you know, are slower to act, higher doses are faster. So the sweet spot is somewhere in between, you know, where, where you have a good speed and no or limited repellency, okay? So this is a study that I did on fire ants, and you can see that some of the nerve toxins like indoxicarp and even like the... Um, Energy disruptors work really fast after each vertical line, which is uh, which is a treatment. Uh, and the blue line shows uh, extinguish, which is a like an IGR. So as you can see, IGR never produced like absolute zeros, but it provided the really really nice uh, steady control over the whole year period. So that's what I was talking about, and this. Boric acid, the reason it didn't work is that it settled out uh, and, and it, it was a sugar water solution. And so that's why, you know, they have, we, we had more ants in boric acid than control. Uh, it was just because the boric acid treatment did not work, okay? So, and the last thing uh, on porous, uh, porous surfaces. So anytime you apply a concrete brick or stone, it's recommended that you use either uh, wet, wet, wettable powder or something with mock encapsulated technology. So you'll maintain a high surface activity. I know that um, FMC has a, like a proprietary uh, formulation on that, but you don't want to use uh, uh, emulsifiable concentrate EC products you know, unless they have this uh, mock encapsulated technology. Uh, because if you if they don't have that, most of the material will get absorbed into the uh, into the substrate, you know, either concrete or uh, brick or stone, and then it, it's not the treatment is not going to be very effective. So I just wanted to thank you guys again. Uh, thank you, thank the host, and also you guys. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarabadi. That was a great. Um, seminar on ants. Just want to again thank everyone uh, for their attendance thank and uh, we will see everyone in the new year. So, uh, you know, start of December, but happy new year to everyone and we will see you in uh, January. Happy holidays. Yeah.